Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for getting up so early in the morning to hear a scientific lecture. <coughs> so I'll try to give an overview of what we know in several fields of uh, cannabis research, and I'll be delighted to, to answer any questions that uh, you may have at the end of the uh, lecture. And that's why I've, uh, 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 my title, the title of the lecture is Looking Back and Ahead. Well, looking back will give us some background of what's going on at the moment, and looking ahead is, well, let's hope that uh, we are looking ahead to uh, better medicines. We're, we're looking ahead of helping a lot of patients in a lot of, uh, diff with a lot of different uh, diseases. Now, this was not what went on many years ago when we started work. And many years means about 50 years ago, I was just appointed uh, to one of the um, uh, institutes, uh, research institutes in Israel, and uh, I'm a natural products chemist, I was looking for interesting projects in the field of natural products, uh, chemistry and pharmacology. And um, uh, one of the topics I chose was looking into the chemistry, pharmacology, and later hopefully biochemistry um, of, cannabis, of cannabis. And I was surprised, very surprised to find out that while we knew quite a lot about morphine, which had been isolated from uh, opium uh, many, many decades previously, and the same was true for uh, cocaine uh, from coca leaves, the chemistry of cannabis was not uh, uh, well known. As a matter of fact, the active product or products uh, had never been isolated in a pure form. The structure was unknown. And um, this is not just a, an academic matter. Uh, there, uh, today, it is impossible to do pharmacological or biochemical or clinical work unless we know exactly what we are working on. I mean, uh, you cannot do a clinical trial and, and tell a patient ca take cannabis and then uh, publish it because physicians today, and rightly so, will not accept it as data. They want a scientifically based quantitative data. They want to know, rightly so, what's going on exactly. And so the starting point was, still is, let's start with the chemistry, uh, elucidate the chemistry, and go ahead into uh, uh, biochemistry, pharmacology, and hopefully clinical trials. But there was completely, there was no, no interest at all. As a matter of fact, when we started working, we couldn't get a, s s a grant from nowhere, uh, which was, unpleasant. We had to do everything. Uh, some, a colleague of mine or a, co a few colleagues of mine and myself, we had to do everything uh, by ourselves. There was absolutely no interest whatsoever. As a matter of fact, the, at the scientific institute where I was working, they were telling me, why don't you work on peptides? It's much more important than looking at a, uh, a plant out there. Well, now things are different. When we were asked uh, uh, last year to write a review uh, in Nature, Nature Neuroscience on cannabis, and uh, they had actually four reviews, one after the other, on the same topic on cannabis in different aspects of cannabis. The, uh, one came out with a history and background. They put it on the front cover with, a, as you can see, with a brain from which cannabis is uh, uh, coming out. Well, things have changed. Uh, so I can see so many people coming here at half past eight in the morning to hear scientific lecture. It, w it couldn't have happened uh, 30, 40 years ago. Well, why is the interest there? There is a review recently published by two NIH uh, uh, scientists, very distinguished scientists, and they say, amongst many other things, modulating endocannabinoid activity may have therapeutic potential in almost all diseases affecting humans, and I give a long list of, uh, of diseases and a huge number of references which I've taken out, uh, and you can see it's neurodegenerative, inflammatory, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, psychiatric, uh, and cancer, and so on. Now, I do not know any other biochemical system, biological system, which uh, uh, which we can say 
that it has therapeutic potential in almost all diseases affecting humans. This is very, very unusual. We cannot say this for the dopaminergic system. We cannot say this for the serotonergic system. It is something else entirely. So obviously, uh, uh, even if it is only 70, 80, 90 percent true, it is still of great interest. And I assume that this is one of the reasons why so many people are now interested uh, in the cannabinoid system from many points of view. So I'll try to summarize uh, some of the things that I see as interesting. But let me start back a few years ago, three, uh, three 4,000 years ago, with the Assyrians. They actually knew quite a bit, and we know that they knew because they left uh, uh, evidence. Um, most of the other tribes that were around, most of the other nations that were around at that time didn't leave that much evidence. But the Assyrians left the evidence on stone, and so we can read it, as long as it has not been destroyed by those crazy people now fighting it there. But this particular one is uh, uh, in London, so it's still there. Well, they had the name for cannabis depending on its activity rather than on the plant itself, and they called it Ganzigunu, and I had somebody, uh, an Assyrian scholar, translate it for me, and it said that it is the drug that takes away the mind, which is not a bad definition, probably better than pot or something else. So, but the drug that takes a while, um, away the mind is just for the psychoactivity. But when it was used for a clinical, uh, when the use was clinical, and we are not exactly sure what kind of diseases they were treating, it seems that they were treating neurological diseases, they call it azalo, and they also used it in religious rites, which I understand that also not unknown here. But if we jump ahead a few years, 2,000 years ahead, we see that the Romans and the Greeks also used it, but surprisingly not for the uh, psychoactivity. And I, uh, I think that it can be well explained. Uh, European cannabis, hemp really, uh, does not contain THC and therefore they didn't see any psychoactivity. Otherwise, I'm sure that the Romans would have used it. They really tried to, uh, uh, to find ways uh, 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 to, to enjoy themselves. Well, the Pliny said that they are good for pain and the Oscorides said it is, uh, they are good for inflammations and the Oscorides was a major mm, influence over 2,000 years. The book or the book uh, of the Oscorides on drugs was really repeated and translated and copied and people used it until the mid 19th century. But if we jump another 2,000 years ago, uh, the physician of Queen Victoria uh, called Russell Reynolds, used to uh, get cannabis from India for Queen Victoria that suffered from migraines. And he found that the European cannabis was not good for her, but Indian cannabis was very good for her. Well, we know that's true. It, uh, uh, under certain circumstances, uh, migraines can be treated or can be prevented, or the activity, or the uh, action of uh, mm, uh, I mean, the migraine can be lowered. But so we have known a lot about cannabis, but uh, as you are well aware, uh, then interest uh, probably was there to a certain extent, but because of legal problems and because of uh, uh, supply problems, nothing or not much was done, although two major groups worked on cannabis in the 30s, uh, Roger Adams in the US, and uh, Alex Todd, who got the Nobel Prize for work in something else. They worked on it, but they never succeeded in act actually isolating the main compounds there, and therefore work uh, 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 didn't go ahead. We got from the police, and in all my early papers, I say thanks to the police, which is not very usual <laughs> in scientific papers. Uh, uh, we, we got a cannabis, or so hashish, Hashish is uh, uh, cannabis that's grown in Lebanon and put in small bags and uh, smuggled. So we got part of the smuggled material and we started extracting the smuggled material and using modern methods, or at least methods that were modern at that time, we were able to isolate a huge number of compounds. Now this is maybe the reason why 
uh, science or why chemistry had not developed until then. The mixture is uh, so complicated that uh, uh, people or scientists, chemists, were not able to identify, to isolate the compounds in there. So we started isolating uh, uh, individual compounds, and we were surprised to see that uh, there are a huge number of compounds. Now, those of you that remember their chemistry will see that these compounds are uh, closely uh, uh, related, if you wish, and uh, we gave uh, uh, their names depending on uh, the terpene part of the molecule. We called it cannabigerol, and we called it cannabicyclol, and cannabichromine, and so on. But although today they are known about, uh, oh, let's say 50, 60, maybe 80 compounds of this type, uh, two of them have been investigated properly. They are the major ones. Uh, these are, uh, two of them are uh, cannabidiol, CBD, and tetrahydrocannabinol, and only one of them, the THC, uh, causes the psychoactivity. So there has been a huge amount of work over the last decade, I would say, uh, on THC, uh, somewhat less than CBD and cannabidiol because it doesn't cause their psychoactivity and therefore the people were less interested. Now, nowadays it seems that uh, actually interest is uh, 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 going on more on cannabidiol because of its uh, therapeutic activities and not being uh, toxic and not being psychoactive. It can be given, it can be administered to patients at huge uh, amounts without any side effects. So there is a lot of interest in cannabidiol, and I hope to uh, have the time to tell you of some of the work we and others have been doing on both compounds. Well, what do we, at that time, what did we mean by active? Well, we didn't know much about uh, the activity, so we tried it on rhesus monkeys. And only one compound, THC, caused sedation uh, to the monkey. Uh, here we have uh, one of the monkeys without getting any material, very active, uh, a little bit dangerous to get near it, it can bite you. But the other one injected with uh, about three milligrams total dose of uh, THC became sedated and my students usually say that, well, that particular uh, rhesus monkey looks like a professor thinking. <laughs> well, for the next nearly 20 years, a lot of people looked at uh, uh, these compounds and uh, we got to know a lot about the mechanism, the biochemistry, the pharmacology of these two compounds. One thing that was not known, uh, and there was a mistake in the literature, was the mechanism. Uh, there was a mistake in the literature, a group at Oxford in the UK, a major pharmacological group, uh, decided or wrote or brought some evidence that uh, THC acts in a non-specific manner, uh, maybe dissolving a nerve or dissolving a, uh, the nerve sheet and so on, and that's why it acts. And it was not a very great interest and people didn't do much about it. Well, we didn't think that that's correct, and we found evidence that uh, Actually, it is not correct, and therefore uh, there should be something more specific, whether it's an enzyme, it, whether the cannabinoids work in an enzyme, work in a receptor, work in some other biological way. And um, a group here in the U US, Alan Howlett, did some excellent work and found the first receptor. And that receptor was found in the brain, uh, in mice, in exactly those areas that are relevant, areas that have to do with movement control with body movement coordination, learning and memory, higher cognitive function, uh, uh, reward pathways, and so on. So this was exactly the areas of the brain one would expect a receptor to be found. Now, uh, we know that receptors are not found just because there is a plant out there. Does, uh, we, it doesn't work that way, otherwise we'll have uh, a fantastic number of receptors in the brain, and it is not uh, true. We have a limited number of receptors, and they're there because we, or uh, uh, animals, produce specific compounds that uh, bind to these receptors, activate them, or block their activity, and that's the way receptors work. 
So we had to go out and find the compounds that we produce and these compounds would stimulate or block the activity of the receptor that Alan Howlett had found. Now, how do you find a receptor? It's not found in great quantities. Normally, it's found in very small amounts, uh, frequently like cannabin endocan endogenous cannabinoids. They are found, uh, they are formed when and where needed. So we would expect to have absolutely minimal amounts not very simple to do it. Well, how does one do that? In general, one takes a compound that is very potent, and in this case, we had a compound that's extremely potent. We called it HU, HU is Hebrew University. We, uh, we took that compound, which is very potent, labeled it, and uh, tried to get it to bind to the receptor, which it does, and then we tried fractions from the brain that will kick out uh, this particular labeled compound from its binding to the receptor. And those areas that do that, then we can take them from the particular area of the brain and try to analyze it and so on. It's easy to tell about. It uh, doesn't take much time. It took us two or three years to do it. A lot of uh, work because it turned out that the compounds ultimately are not very stable. But after two years or so three years of work, uh, uh, my postdocs, uh, Bill Devane and, and others found, and that we were able with some modern equipment to determine the structures. And the stru two structures, uh, uh, we found out two compounds which are present in our brain and in our body. The first one we called anandamide. Ananda in Sanskrit is a supreme joy, and we thought, probably correctly to a certain extent, we thought that it may be involved in our uh, in, in joy or other uh, effects, and we called it indeed anandamide. The other one uh, we should have called ananda uh, ester, but we are not sure at the beginning that it is indeed a natural product, so we called it 2-AG, and it turned out that both compounds are the major endogenous cannabinoids in our body, in our brain, and THC in fact mimics the activity of these endogenous compounds. So here we have endogenous compounds of extreme interest, at least to us of extreme interest, and these two compounds are being mimicked in their activity um, by uh, THC. So here we had a, a good basis, and it has been supported by hundreds of papers, and there is a lot of interest in these, paper, in these compounds. Now those of you that remember the chemistry will see that an andamide and 2-AG, the endogenous compounds, are completely different structurally from tetrahydrocannabinol. And yet they bind to the same receptor. They're essentially uh, uh, equivalent in their activity, although THC stays for a longer time in the body because it has to be uh, metabolized and uh, 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 takes some time, and that's why the activity is prolonged. While anandamide and 2-AG are formed when and where needed, not throughout the brain, not, not throughout the body, when and where needed. They cause whatever they have to cause, lower pain or do something else, and then they are broken by uh, specific enzymes. So we have now a system which has become quite complicated. First of all, we have the two, the two receptors. One of them uh, causes the psychoactivity. The other one, and I'll try to talk a little bit about the second one, does not cause any psychoactivity, but it is a protective enzyme. It seems to be, uh, enzy uh, it seems to be a receptor that has to do uh, in parallel, if you wish, with the activity of the immune system. It's a protective um, mechanism. Activation of the CB2 receptor is a protective measure. It's like the immune system. The immune system guards us against Mostly, it does all kinds of other things, but it guards us mostly against um, proteins, microbes come, coming from the outside. Uh, this, but there are many things that are not involved. He, this particular system complements the activity of the immune system. So we have two receptors. We have two major endogenous compounds that affect these two receptors. We have enzymes that form the uh, uh, 
these endogenous compounds and enzymes that break down these endogenous compounds. So we can work on them. If we suppress one of them, those that form the uh, endogenous cannabinoids, then we have lower amounts of those endogenous cannabinoids. If we suppress the enzymes that break down these two endogenous cannabinoids, then we have higher levels. So there, is a lot of, uh, there are a lot of possibilities, and this is what happens in the body. Then we have uh, THC and CBD, THC acts in the receptor. CBD does not. We really do not know when and where cannabidiol works. We have some indications in many diseases, in many uh, different uh, physiological states. We know uh, that particular uh, activity, that how cannabidiol works, but there is something missing. We still am not sure what, how cannabidiol works in all cases. And then we discovered, and many other groups also discovered that, that in addition to anandamide and 2-AG, there is a huge, huge number of compounds closely related chemically. Now, anandamide is a simple compound. It is a fatty acid, and the body there are about 20 of them. There is a fatty acid bound to amino acid. That's it, simple. A little bit of a few changes, but that's it. Fatty acid bound to amino acid. Now we have a few, a few fatty acids, we have a few amino acids, they can bind to each other, and therefore we have something like 200 of them in our brain, in our body. And we ver know very little about the activity of these 200 or 150, 200 compounds. Some of them present in minute amounts, some, some are present in somewhat larger amounts. We are starting to learn about them, and it turns out that those that have been investigated all of them, all of those that have been investigated, have some kind of activity, not necessarily cannabinoid-type activity. They may have all kinds of other activities, and I'll mention some of them. So the field is becoming very complicated. We have so many compounds. Now, why does the body make so many compounds? Difficult to say. Maybe it has something to do with uh, other th uh, things that are happening. Maybe it has to do with... Uh, also, uh, personality, mean formation of our personality. But, so we have an endocannabinoid system which is becoming quite complicated and um, changes of this endocannabinoid system uh, may lead to pathological state, to diseases of one type and another. And we have to learn that. And in order to modify the changes which uh, uh, cause the disease. So uh, after making things very complicated, I'll try to go into uh, specific uh, diseases, if you wish. But let's see. What do the endocannabinoids do? My good friend DiMarzo said, well, that was almost 10 years ago. Well, the endocannabinoids call person to relax, eat, sleep, forget, and protect. Well, you can see that out of these five uh, activities, uh, four are certainly positive, relax, eat, sleep, protect. Forget is not so positive. Well, it is positive. If you go into a supermarket and you see 500 people there, you definitely don't want to remember all of them. This, so uh, forgetting is also positive as long as it is in the right way of doing it. Uh, now we know that it's much more complicated than that. Uh, this is a slide that I prepared some years, a year ago, and we have a, a short list. I can probably add another 20 activities, and they... The endocannabinoid system is involved from anxiety, appetite, blood pressure, etc., etc., down to movement disorder, neuroprotection, pain, reproduction, stress. So it is essentially all, essentially all activities. So if there are any changes in the endocannabinoid system, we can see changes in that kind of activity. Well, not a very simple situation, certainly not a very simple situation uh, for, um, for a clinician. Uh, he cannot treat all of these things. So I'll try to show how uh, specific these changes can be. I will not go into the biochemistry, not go into the physiology. It's, it will take too much time. I'll mention just one thing. Uh, as we know, the nerves are not a, a nerve is not a string from one place to another. Definitely not. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, breaks in that uh, uh, string, if you wish, 
and the break is in order to make possible a regulation of the uh, of the signal, signal that goes from one place to another place. And this break is called a synapse, and we have the presynaptic part and the postsynaptic part, and the movement, the uh, movement of the signal from one part to another is chemical. There are chemicals that go from the presynapse to the postsynapse. Well, the body does it more complicated. It has to regulate that movement of chemicals, dopamine or any others, or glutamate. It has to regulate it. How does it regulate it? One of the ways is by the endocannabinoid mechanism. The endocannabinoids, when needed, are formed on the postsynapse. They move from the postsynapse to the presynapse. They bind to, the, to their own uh, receptors, and then they can block the uh, release of uh, neurotransmitters from the presynapse to the postsynapse. So in addition to the activity, their own activity, the activity of the endocannabinoids, they also regulate the activity of many other neurotransmitters. And that's why it ha they have so many uh, activities, because they have activities of their own, and they also uh, regulate the activities of uh, quite a few other neurotransmitters. So things are becoming very complicated, but I will uh, uh, not go into that part of uh, uh, cannabinoid research, but we'll go and speak about specific uh, uh, situation, uh, clinical situations, uh, like neuroprotection. Uh, my good friend, Esti Shohami, she's a specialist in brain trauma. Uh, we looked at the levels of one of the endocannabinoids after brain trauma in, uh, in mice. And we saw that one of the endocannabinoids, the 2-AG, goes up nearly tenfold uh, after uh, brain trauma. So is that just because the brain has been traumatized and doesn't know what it does, or is it just a reaction of the brain in order to lower the damage? And uh, the red thing you can see here uh, shows the level of 2-AG after the brain trauma with after four hours, quite a bit. And we thought, well, let's see whether it's a protective mechanism. So we synthesized uh, enough 2-AG and gave it to uh, traumatized mice and uh, went on to look whether uh, the damage that has been done on the brain goes down. And indeed, uh, we're not going into great details, we, gave, we did all kinds of things, but we gave these brains to uh, the histologists and they were surprised to find out that those brains uh, the brains of mice that had been administered 2-AG had 50% less damage. You can see the damage, the white part in the brain. Those that receive 2-AG have much less white part, that's the damaged part, that's the dead part, if you wish, than the controls that didn't receive 2-AG. Two, uh, two and that was done several times. That was published in Nature uh, quite, quite a few years ago. And uh, so we believe, we strongly believe that these compounds are neuroprotective after brain trauma. Now, why this has not advanced to clinical trials, although we completed quite a lot of work on that and other people have done also work on that, I have no idea, but this is something quite general. We have a lot of interesting data uh, in mice and that's it. It has not progressed further, although brain damage conditions are of extreme importance nowadays. Not nowadays, it always have been. Um, what about actions that go through the CB1 receptor? Well, uh, those clinicians here or general public knows that uh, cancer chemotherapy, although it may be very valuable and uh, at times uh, causes side effects, again at times, which are uh, very, very unpleasant. And we decided to try uh, THC in cases of cancer chemotherapy in children. Uh, uh, I was in close touch with a colleague of mine, 
heads of department of, uh, of uh, pediatric cancer in one of the hospitals. And uh, of course, she was telling me about the tragic situation of children getting cancer chemotherapy, uh, being uh, crying most of the time and feeling terrible. And it was a tragic for, the, for them and for the families. Could we do something? So we decided to try THC and do a double blind study. 50% of the children will get a placebo, 50% will get THC in addition to the cancer chemotherapy, of course. And after a week, she came back to me and said, I can't do it. I know exactly who is getting it, maybe double blind or triple blind or four times blind. I know exactly who is getting it. Those that are getting the THC do not vomit. They feel fine. Those that are not getting it feel terrible. So she did a, an open study. We ultimately published it, and we found that indeed THC given to those children in uh, uh, olive oil under the tongue helped essentially 100% of the patients. Very strange, because one doesn't see in clinical trials 100% of uh, activity, but that's what she found. We published it, and I believe that it's being used here and there, but not enough. And it, it can be used. It's uh, uh, innocuous, and uh, we can help uh, children uh, suffering from that. What happens here? I, I can't move the slides. Can you help? Oh, here it is. Um, then we tried something else. We knew that feeding, eating, is affected by uh, cannabinoids. So uh, pups were injected with an antagonist to the system, to the CB1, and uh, we saw that the pups uh, did not uh, go to the mother and did not suck anymore. Although they obviously should have sucked in order to remain alive, they just didn't. Sat around, their brothers and sisters did that, and continues uh, growing. Those that didn't just sat around and after a week or so would die. So obviously the cannabinoid system is important in sucking. Uh, if, as I said, if we block it, they don't suck. But if we, in the middle, after two or three days, and see that the pups are not sucking, we give them THC, large amounts, they will start again and go grow and so on. So obviously it's a very important factor in, uh, uh, in child feeding in uh, suckling in this case. Now, a company uh, looked at that, and they also saw that uh, in cases of ACE, for example, if ACE are given THC, the patients remain at their weight for a much longer time than those that got uh, placebo. So the company, Sanofi, uh, had a, an antagonist, and they gave it to uh, pay, to overweight patients, and they knew that that's a huge number of patients. The U.S., in most of the Western countries, and they'll have a, a huge number of patients. They'll make a lot of money, and they develop this particular compound, called it Remonoband, and they put it on the market, and after uh, just a few weeks, they took it out. And the reason for that was they didn't think enough about the other effects of, of uh, uh, the cannabinoid system. The cannabinoid system has to do with anxiety. It lowers anxiety. And if you give an antagonist, it not only blocks appetite or lowers uh, the, the amount of, of food one takes, but it also enhances uh, uh, anxiety because we block the system, the system which has to do with, with anxiety. And quite a few patients became anxious, and I believe that one or two I wanted to commit suicide. I'm not sure about it. I heard rumors that this was so, and they took it out of the market. Well, so we have to know quite a lot before um, doing something of that sort. Maybe they should have told the patients, if you're anxious, don't take it. Well, anyway, Ramona Bound was taken out of the market. And um, then another uh, uh, effect that we worked on, and this was a small clinical trial on uh, traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Uh, there are quite a lot of patients with uh, PTSD, 
we had about 10. Uh, some of them were soldiers who had been involved. Some, maybe a friend of theirs was killed next to them and they went into a mm, uh, post-trauma. There were two women that were raped. There were two uh, men and a woman, I think, uh, that were involved in a traffic accident. And we started giving them a THC, five milligrams a day, twice or three times a day. And the clinician who did that work, Dr. Reutemann, a psychiatrist, uh, he, as I said, gave them five milligrams per day. And he looked at a lot of uh, the effects and there are all kinds of uh, clinical uh, things that uh, people that are involved in PTSD have developed. And they uh, wrote them down and looked at the frequency of nightmares, the sleep quality, uh, the uh, global symptom severity, and so on. And indeed, he found that there were positive effects. He didn't uh, uh, see any complete elimination of the PTSD, but he saw very uh, a great improvement, in particularly in sleep. These patients uh, frequently cannot sleep or are afraid to go to sleep because they are afraid that they will uh, recall the, the, ef the effect that caused uh, the uh, trauma that caused this effect whether it was a, tr uh, a rape or whether it was a, an accident, whether it was a person killed next to him. So uh, I believe that it can be used, it should be used in a way that uh, uh, we can help uh, PTSD patients. What about the CB2 receptor, which is more interesting because the CB2 does not cause any uh, side effects? Well, um, as I said, I believe that the CB2 system parallels to a lot extent the immune system. Uh, it has to, it can do a lot of, uh, a lot of things which are, in which external proteins are not involved. And indeed, there are long lists of effects which certainly go, uh, show in that direction. And uh, we believe that uh, the CB2 system, the research on the CB2 system will lead us to a lot of information showing that the two systems together, the immune system and the CB2 action work together and are of major importance to what's going on. And uh, indeed we have prepared synthetic compounds which act only on the CB2 receptor. And these compounds do not bind to the CB1 receptor. You can see the numbers there, doesn't matter. It, uh, Generally, the fact is they do not bind to the CB1 receptor, they bind only to the CB2 receptor, and therefore they can be used, hopefully, as drugs uh, in, in the CB2 system. And um, work that has been done at NIH uh, by uh, a group uh, has shown that uh, one of these compounds, which we call HU910, attenuates inflammation, lowers damage associated with hepatic reperfusion injury, and there's all kinds of positive things. So I believe that the uh, CB2, specific CB2 action will be uh, of uh, considerable importance, and uh, quite a few, both academic labs and industrial labs are looking at the CB2 system because of its uh, lack of uh, side effects. It has been shown to act in Crohn's disease, in inflammatory bowel disease, in asthma. All this is uh, in animals. Uh, unfortunately, no uh, clinical trials, yes. The most important or most interesting, most advanced thing is actually work on cannabidiol. As I said, no, cannabidiol does not cause any uh, side effects. It does not bind to the receptors. And we have seen that it acts on anxiety, very a good action in anxiety in many cases. We have seen that in mice. Mice are anxious all the time. They're afraid of, of cats. They're afraid of us. If positive, they stay in a dark part, and there is something called the elevated plus maze, which is uh, up a meter above, the place where a mouse can be in the dark or it can get out. Uh, and the amount of time it gets out of the dark place shows the lowering of anxiety. A lot of psych, uh, people that work in psychopharmacology are using this method. And we found that indeed, uh, 
cannabidiol as well derivatives cannabidiol do that. They lower the anxiety of mice. And as we well know, cannabidiol also lowers the anxiety in humans. Unfortunately, again, we don't have uh, uh, many uh, clinical trials. I think we have uh, just one or two. Uh, inflammation. Uh, a good friend of mine, and together with a group in the uh, UK, uh, uh, the person that did the work in the UK was in London at that time, and now he's at Oxford. And we found that indeed cannabidiol lowers uh, rheumatoid arthritis and in mice. But here we saw something which seems to be quite typical for cannabinoids at, okay, 2.5 milligrams per kilo, we saw no effect. At five milligrams per kilo, which is the red one on the bottom, yes, there is a very positive effect. Uh, I wouldn't explain how we get a, a clinical score, but we get a very good effect of uh, uh, anti-rheumatoid arthritis. Great. But then if we go at to higher doses, we get less effect. So here we have something which is a double phase. I mean, nothing at a very low level, quite a bit of activity at a somewhat higher level, but then the activity disappears at even uh, uh, if uh, the concentration of the drug has gone up. So this is not very uh, uh, simple to, uh, to, to lead us to clinical trials because we have to find uh, the amount of material that will be relevant to humans. But again, it should be done. Now, this particular uh, disease, arthritis, is an autoimmune disease. The body attacks its own body. So we said, okay, if it works on an, uh, this kind of arthritis, maybe it will work in uh, um, diabetes type 1, which is also an autoimmune disease. The body attacks the cells that produce insulin. And uh, although there are drugs that uh, work in diabetes type 1, insulin by itself works. Uh, maybe we can have a new type of drug which will be very efficient. And indeed, when we gave cannabidiol to a strain of mice that all of them develop uh, diabetes type 1, we saw a extremely good effects. And we started giving the drug after the mice had, were already developing the disease. That is to say they are uh, during the 12th or 13th week of, uh, 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 of their lives. When they start developing diabetes type 1, their body attacks the cells that produce insulin. And normally, 80 to 100% of these mice get the disease and they die from the disease. If we give cannabidiol uh, at relatively high doses, we see that only 30% of the mice get the disease. Now, here, really, it, it is open to clinical trials because the disease, in this case, is exactly the same. It's not just a simple model. It is exactly the same. Here we have a, a situation which the body attacks the cells that produce uh, insulin. This is what happens in diabetes type 1 in human patients we should be able to do a clinical trial essentially at once. Uh, and unfortunately, although we published that quite some years ago, it is still not, uh, it, is, it has not been tried. Very unfortunate because I believe that here we have an open situation. And if you look, don't forget everything else, just the, uh, the percent intact islets, the cells that produce it, though the controls only 8% of the cells are still intact. But if we give CBD, 77% of the cells that produce insulin are intact. A huge difference. And here we have a good explanation. And I see no reason why it shouldn't happen in humans as well. Uh, we shall have a lecture on epilepsy later on. But uh, let's uh, try to tell you of something that we did uh, more than 35 years ago. After looking at animals in animal trials, we decided to go into epilepsy in humans. We took 15 epileptic patients that nothing was helping them anymore. We were separated into those that got the placebo and those that got the drug. And of those that got the drug, we gave them for four and a half months pure cannabidiol at very high doses. Now, that was not simple because I had to prepare in the lab 
about 400 grams, almost half a kilo of ca pure cannabidiol, which uh, it's not very simple for an academic lab to do, but we uh, got the 400 grams, sent them to South America, and they did there, that, and found that uh, the four patients out of eight remained almost completely free of seizures. And three had a partial improvement and one showed no improvement, which was uh, what one would expect in a clinical trial. And of course, the placebo uh, people continue to have their seizures. So we thought 35 years ago, well, here we have a, a small trial. Uh, it should be expanded by a clinical group or by a company. And here we can have a new anti-epileptic drug. And we know that not all epileptic patients uh, uh, are helped by the drugs that exist at the moment. But then nothing happened. For 35, for almost 30 years, nothing happened. Nobody bothered to repeat it. Nobody bothered to go ahead and give it to adults or children. But then parents that had epileptic children, nothing was helping them learned of this paper, learned of uh, uh, observations that show that, uh, well, some cannabis uh, strains with a lot of cannabidiol help. Let's try it because nothing else helps. So there have been a lot of uh, individual cases in which patients, parents have given uh, the drug to their children and it has helped. And there has been quite a lot of noise around it in the US in particular, and therefore two years ago, a clinical trial was started. And I understand the uh, uh, results are quite positive at the moment. In Israel, uh, um, cannabidiol strains, cannabidiol containing strains, are officially allowed to be administered, to, to be given to children, and there are quite a lot of children that get it. Uh, and so this is also happening here. But it shouldn't have waited 35 years. It could have been done 30 years ago. Why it didn't? Well, it didn't. Um, there is, there is so much that, a clean, that a, an academic lab can do. And, I'm, and this is the situation with quite a few of the things I'm describing. Uh, schizophrenia, slightly different. Uh, we had shown that in individual cases, cannabidiol, very high doses, helps schizophrenia. And a German group did a relatively major study. They looked at schizophrenia. Uh, and they found that, uh, indeed, uh, uh, cannabidiol is equivalent to uh, one of the major drugs that's being used today in schizophrenia with one small difference. Uh, although the, the results were the same between the drug that's being used today and cannabidiol, the drug that's being used today has side effects. Many of these drugs have side effects, strong side effects. Cannabidiol had no side effects. So, uh, they as I said, they compared CBD with amisulpride, and they found that they have the same type of activity. And I hope, I sincerely hope, that cannabidiol will be used uh, in uh, 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 schizophrenic patients, but I haven't heard of any additional clinical studies, although the German paper was published 19, uh, about uh, uh, four, four and a half years ago. And I will end, uh, because of lack of time, uh, with graft versus host disease. Now, this is a, a man caused disease. Many patients with uh, certain cancers have their uh, bone marrow transplanted. And uh, Mm, this causes uh, serious uh, uh, side effects. Many of the patients are very sick. And the disease is basically, again, a disease in which the body attacks its own body. In this case, the body attacks something that we have transplanted. And the transplant itself uh, attacks the body. So what's going on is that uh, the person is very sick. In cases of children, I've seen children that have uh, transplanted uh, bone marrow, and they are in a terrible shape. Really, uh, one cannot stand that. And w w it was found that uh, it lowers the uh, effects 
by nearly 50% uh, in uh, 100 patients that served as control. We had 46% with GVHD, with the disease, and only 12% in those that got cannabidiol. And those that really had a bad, bad case, this is called a three or four grade of uh, GVHD, we lowered that from 10% to 5%. And now a further clinical trial is going on with uh, many more patients. Now, um, I think that uh, I'll have to stop here, though I have quite a few other things I would have liked to tell you, like new cannabidiol type compounds and uh, some uh, regulation vasodilation. And just mention one thing, the endocannabinoids like anandamide, there are additional compounds, as I mentioned. Uh, first, uh, was I said at the beginning, uh, quite a lot of additional compounds way, which do the same thing. On the top, you can see anandamide. On the bottom, you can see a compound called arachidonoyl serine, which are not very different structurally, but they do completely different things. And we hope that investigations will go on with these compounds, and we shall know quite a lot uh, about them uh, within the next few years. And I want to summarize, the endocannabinoids are involved in a large number of physiological processes with both THC and CBD. There, there are those compounds which I didn't have enough time to discuss that are fatty acids bound to amino acids. We still have to learn a lot about them. I believe they are extreme importance. Surprisingly, we know very little about it. And I hope that specific CB2 agonists will lead to new types of drugs. And I want to thank the collaborators in Israel. You can see on the left, uh, people that worked in my lab. I collaborate with a lot of colleagues. My lab is a, essentially a chemical, a biochemical lab, but I collaborate with people that work in bones, in uh, uh, traumas, and so on. And I work with uh, uh, a large number of colleagues abroad, and here are some of them. Uh, Roger Pertwee in the UK, and uh, you can see Bone, and the Czech state, and uh, many, many others. And they visit me, I visit them, uh, and we drink a lot of coffee together, and we enjoy uh, in changing information. And I've visited all of them, enjoy going in, uh, to their labs. I've been to all of, to all of them, except one. Uh, Dr. Maslov in Siberia had a meeting in a few months ago in February, and he wrote me that, no, you don't have to worry, the, the weather is okay. Usually it's minus 35 centigrade, now it's only 25 centigrade. And I said, thank you, maybe next time, and thank you. <laughs> No problem. Yeah. We, we have a few minutes for questions, folks. So if you'd like to ask the doctor a question, please step up to one of the mics. Any questions at all? We'd love to have a few questions. I'd like I'll to ask a question. A question. Right Go ahead. If I'm clear, you're saying we have found anandamide, these endocannabinoids, and now we're finding 200 more. And you're sorting out that code to all those endocannabinoids. Is there being a correlation made just the way anandamide correlates with THC? Are we seeing or are we studying the correlation of all those other endocannabinoids and associating them with the action or chemical structure of all the other phytocannabinoids? From what we know at the moment, uh, anandamide or THC mimics anandamide. It doesn't mimic the other compounds. The body uh, is uh, lazy. So once it knows how to make anandamide, it makes a lot of other compounds uh, going to the same enzyme system, but the compounds that are formed are not necessarily endocannabinoids in their action. They do all kinds of other things. This is known 
throughout our system. For example, uh, the steroid system, once the body knows how to make the steroid, by making small changes on the steroid, you get different type of compounds, uh, estrogens that work uh, as uh, uh, female hormones, but you have compounds that have nothing to do with estrogen, again with the same basic structure. Here we have the same. We have the same basic structure, an amino acid ba uh, bound to a fatty acid, but it has completely different activities. And as we have 150 compounds of that type, who knows what they are doing? So we have, yes, an endomide that is being mimicked by THC, but we also have a lot of other compounds of which we know just a tiny little bit. One compound that I may discuss this afternoon is a compound which we found that has to do with osteoporosis, and it blocks uh, the destruction of bones after a certain age. So here we have something completely different, and yet it goes a following the same chemical system, uh, because the body uh, knows how to do it. Well, to make a correlation, you've discovered this endochemical that affects osteoporosis, and then would there be a logical jump then to CBG or another phytocannabinoid that is known as bone growth stimulator? Probably, I think the answer is yes, probably yes. Hey, uh, my question for you, Dr. Mishulam, is how much research are you doing specifically with terpenes um, and terpenes in conjunction with cannabinoids? Um, and what I mean by that is Dr. Sue Sicily, who is studying uh, PTSD with uh, cannabis, she's not permitted to study terpenes with her research, and we all know that you know the D-lemonine is what causes PTSD patients to have bad reactions, whereas linalool um, is kind of the opposite effect. How much of your work is devoted to terpenes? Well, uh, the cannabis plant contains a large number of additional compounds, compounds that are not cannabinoids. It contains terpenes, uh, flavonoids, all kinds of other things. Many years ago, we found that there is something we call the entourage effect. We called it entourage effect, meaning that compounds that by themselves are not very active or not active at all change the activity of other compounds, in this case of cannabinoids. And indeed, this has been seen by many people taking cannabinoids, saying, well, the total plant works much better than just plain THC. THC is a, an official drug in this country, but not a, uh, a particularly um, successful one. But the plant is. And it seems to be that there is a major uh, thing for going on, and it's this entourage effect. Unfortunately, in addition to our own paper quite a few years ago, there has been very little work done on the entourage effect. We know that it exists, but it has to be much more uh, um, investigated, and it has not been investigated, which is a pity, but again, it's one of those lacunas, if you wish, that have to be looked into. Thank you. Hi, my name is Valeria, and I wanted to ask you, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Uh, secondly, uh, I wanted to ask you to share your uh, ideas about the role of cannabinoids and the transmission of the pain uh, signals in uh, in the body. The reason I ask is that uh, I went through the literature and I found out that uh, many uh, researchers indicated that uh, THC and cannabinoids, they do not have profound effect on the severe pain. They may have uh, some effect on the local pains, and I know that uh, the recent studies made in the uh, performed in the United States uh, by the combination of CBD and THC uh, in the cancer pain didn't produce uh, any uh, hopeful results. So I want to uh, hear what you think about that. Well, I believe you're right. It seems that a mixture, in the case of pain at least, of CBD and THC seems to be better than THC alone. I wish we had more information of the amounts of the types of pain, and not every pain, of course, is the same. 
uh, cannabinoids do not work on acute pain, but they work on neuropathic pain, and uh, we have to know more about it. Yes, chances are that uh, it's better to have both CBD and THC. Chances are that it's better to have uh, THC and maybe some of the other compounds than to rush compounds, but again, the data in the literature is insignificant. Thank you. We have time for one more question. And then uh, uh, Dr. Matulam will be available during coffee break to answer questions. Uh, so he will be out in the lobby and, and uh, you'll get a chance to meet him uh, after uh, we break here. Sir? First of all, thanks for speaking. That was mind blowing. Um, but I wanted to say, I just wanted to, like, when you're talking about the, the CB1 receptor. I can't hear you well. Oh, yeah, hold on. Yeah, let me see. When you're talking about the there we go, um, the CB1 receptor and how you had that whole um, program for like how the synapses work, I was wondering what were like the obstacles that you were facing with the like with the CB2 receptor. I know you were saying we don't know a lot about that one compared to the CB1. Uh, I'm sorry, I mean I didn't get what did they ask. Just like the difference between studying the CB1 receptor when you had the nerve synapse before compared to the CB2. Well, uh, there should be investigations in both. The CB1 is uh, acted upon by THC, by both endocannabinoids. The CB2 is also acted on by THC and both endocannabinoid receptors. It acts, uh, therefore, the activity is uh, dispersed. I believe that uh, uh, the way we and many others are going ahead by trying to have specific CB2 agonists is very promising, uh, having the activity only in the CB2 in this, in this way, eliminating any possible uh, psychoactivity. And this, but at the moment, there isn't a single drug on the market which is CB2 specific. If this is the, if, if, this was, if I understood you well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. I appreciate it.